Firstly, uh, my name is CJ Frost. I'm a restoration carpenter here at Copper Forest. Uh, relatively new. I've been here since uh, since August of, of this year. Uh, but I've really been enjoying learning the, the history of, of this place uh, and the story of, of Jefferson and the construction uh, of, of basically his world. Uh, not only his world here at Poplar Forest, but also his world at Monticello. Um, and uh, this uh, pamphlet that I handed out to everyone, uh, it's, it's yours to keep if you like it. If not, then uh, give it back to me and I'll distribute it at the next talk. Um, but if you open it up, uh, there's something in here that you might find helpful. I know I did. Uh, there's a bit of a, a timeline here. Now this timeline doesn't get into too many specifics, uh, but it's a kind of a rough timeline of uh, John Hemings's life. The, who here already knows who John Hemings was? All right, a few. That's wonderful. Um, for those of you who don't know exactly who he is, uh, uh, John Hemings was a, an enslaved joiner. Uh, at Monticello and, and here at Poplar Forest. And uh, he actually came, went from being uh, born into slavery uh, at Monticello, owned by Thomas Jefferson, uh, to becoming the master of the joiner shop at Mulberry Row uh, at, uh, at Monticello in Albemarle County. And, uh, and his work, most of it, uh, really shines here at Poplar Forest. Um, and for uh, the, re the remainder of his life, which work here at Poplar Forest, really starting in 1809 uh, until the end of his life in 1833, uh, he was uh, the definition of a high-class, fine joiner uh, who worked uh, directly for, at that time, former President Thomas Jefferson. And this talk is about him and his life. So when you look at this timeline, you'll see there are a lot of things there that may be in history that you know that isn't on this timeline. That's OK. It's specific to uh, Mr. Hemings and his work. So uh, you're welcome to use that to, to follow along. Um, if you have questions uh, during my talk, uh, raise your hand. I'm happy to answer them. There will be time for questions at the end. All right. Um, so in order to get into this story and fully immerse ourselves in what's going on here, uh, let's go back in time and place to uh, 1776. Let's uh, pick a date, July 4th, 1776. And a uh, quick pop quiz, July 4th, 1776, what is that date? Ratification of the Declaration. That's right, thank you very much. So ratification of the Declaration of Independence um, this document, written by Thomas Jefferson, of course, uh, is uh, this is what kicks off officially the revolution uh, known to us as the War of Independence. Goes to King George in England, and this formally starts hostilities between the colonies and Great Britain. Um, a few months before this document is ratified, in April, a boy is born into slavery at Monticello. His name is John Hemings. Now, John Hemings, uh, he's born to a woman named Elizabeth Hemings. She goes by Betty. And she's kind of the matriarch of a very large uh, enslaved uh, family of, of women uh, who have uh, been working at Monticello and, and come from Bedford County for quite some time. And she's actually, <coughs> she's a mixed race woman herself. She's the daughter of an enslaved uh, woman and a free white man. Please come in. Um, and so, um, uh, so John Hemings himself, to give you an idea of, of what he may look like, of course, there's, there are any photographs at this time. Then there are uh, no known paintings of, of his likeness. Uh, but he would have been uh, himself a, a what, uh, what we call a mixed race uh, uh, enslaved person at Monticello. And he spends uh, his boyhood uh, up until the age of 14 uh, basically working out in, in the fields, doing uh, boys' work, helping out, assisting with the crops. Uh, and, uh, and when he becomes um, 14 years old, uh, he goes to work as what's called an out carpenter. Now, an out carpenter uh, in those days was the kind of 
uh, worker who would go out into the, into the woods, into the forest, around the property uh, at Monticello, and they would be responsible for cutting down trees. So they're, they're felling trees, they're turning these trees into uh, firewood, uh, so they're building up cords of wood to uh, feed the uh, immense uh, heating needs and cooking needs of uh, the household at Monticello. Um, they're uh, building fences. They're turning these trees into the wood to make fences, ancillary kinds of, of uh, outbuildings around the property. Uh, they're building log cabins for um, uh, other enslaved quarters uh, here on the property. Uh, and, uh, and so this is where John Hemmings gets his first taste of carpentry. But to give you an idea of some of the tools that we're talking about here, we're talking about very rudimentary tools. Um, so he's going out into the, into the woods and, and he's using a, a, a large uh, felling axe to, to cut down trees. <coughs> so he goes out in, uh, into the woods with this, get this gang of other workers and he's, and he's cutting down trees and this is heavy, heavy, hard work. I don't know if any, many of you out there have worked with trees, but they're, they're green, they're wet, they're full of water, I and mean, tons and tons, just by its very nature, it's extraordinarily dangerous work. And here he is, a 14-year-old boy, doing this work uh, with this group of men. Now, on top of this, not only is he learning about how to, to swing an ax and cut a tree down, but he's also learning the rudimentary aspects of wood as a material, as a component to build with, and uh, particularly in building cabins. So he's learning about not just the, the, the axe that is a, a tool of British force, so to speak, but he's also using tools like this. Now this looks like some kind of you know, uh, <laughs> old ancient battle axe, but this is actually a, a very special axe for doing much more refined work so, for example, in, in hewing timbers into logs, or logs into timbers uh, to make um, uh, hewn buildings, uh, log cabins. And in fact, even if you go into what we call the granddaughter's room over here in the house, uh, you might have noticed the exposed uh, beams, the exposed wood there, the timber framing. In fact, uh, the wood elements, the skeleton, the bones, so to speak, of this house, and those of, of Monticello are timber framed. So a tool like this would have been used to refine those round logs into square shapes that we're familiar with building with. So this is where Hemings is getting to understand wood um, uh, really from a, a very early age. And he spends quite some time doing this. He's, he's doing this kind of work, uh, what we would consider rough carpentry, for about five years. Five years. Now, after five years, um, work really is, is ramping up at Monticello. Um, by this time, Thomas Jefferson has already been the minister to France. He's lived in Paris for quite some time, um, and uh, he has really fallen in love with the, the culture and the architecture uh, and just uh, and the furniture, just all these design elements that, uh, that so many of us, if, if you've been to Paris, uh, so many people still fall in love with uh, the architecture of, of Ah Paris. And uh, so, uh, so he comes back and he decides that this is what he wants uh, his home, Monticello, to, to reflect, are these refined qualities that he's picked up while he's been away in France. So almost immediately, uh, he starts to tear down uh, the old parts of, of his home and, and he redesigns from scratch himself uh, using ancient rules of proportion uh, to develop this uh, amazing villa from what was once a, a, a very nice, uh, respectable plantation mansion, but really turns it into something that would really kind of inspire uh, a sense of awe and architectural greatness uh, in this country. And so uh, he has hired uh, a, a number of, of free white carpenters, among them a man named David Watson. Now David Watson uh, was uh, uh, an English deserter. Uh, he had uh, been fighting for king and country 
And he decided that that just was not for him that was in the fight. He believed in it anymore. And so he deserted uh, the, the British Army. And uh, sometime after the Revolutionary War, he goes to work for Thomas Jefferson as, as a carpenter and joiner <coughs> at Monticello. Now, <coughs> David Watson is known as uh, a wheelwright. That's really where his, his specialty in carpentry lies. Now, making wheels and carriages, uh, things that move, it requires a much different way of thinking about wood and measuring and laying things out than uh, most kinds of, of carpentry and joinery. It's really a specialized form of woodworking. And so uh, uh, Watson uh, actually is tasked with taking John Hemmings, who's now who's been for five years this, uh, this rough carpenter, so to speak, this out carpenter, uh, and teach him the ways of making wheels and other kinds of woodwork necessary to the ongoings of the plantation at Monticello. So uh, as Hem goes to work for him, uh, he's learning yet another side of this carpentry trade. Okay? And this is all very important because he's, it's building him up to be what he is, is most known for today among scholars who can appreciate who John Hemmings is, and at the end of this talk, hopefully you will too, as uh, you know, to the input of the, the joinery that he's made and the furniture that he produced as well. So in his work with, with Watson, uh, this introduces him to a new set of tools. So uh, we've gone from working with the axes or splitting wood and cutting wood uh, to much more refined ways of, of manipulating it into, into shape but still not so refined as to be uh, presentable to the, uh, the distinguished palette, so to speak. So he's going, he's starting to use saws, maybe saws like this one. You can see the size of these, these teeth here, like the great big shark's teeth. Well, um, this is made for, for cutting large, rough pieces of timber and getting them into shape so that they can be put up in, into walls or to frame doors and frame windows with. Um, but still, it's, it's a much different style of working. So now instead of swinging the tool over his shoulder and working his back, now he's working on uh, a pair of trestles or benches, and he's using much more refined strokes to follow a line, so to speak, something that he might uh, have made with uh, a snap line, a chalk line, or, or, or a plumb bob like this. So now he's learning the elements of how these pieces of wood are laid together and how they form a, a structure and based off of rules, uh, universal principles of things like gravity, uh, he can lay out what's, what's plumb, what's vertical, and what's truly horizontal. And this will, of course, be one of the foundations of, uh, of the building rules that will follow him throughout his life as he becomes uh, a carpenter and later a joiner and also as a furniture maker. Additionally, he's learning things like uh, proportion and measurements and calculations that are really beyond the scope <coughs> of, of a, a rough carpenter, someone cutting down trees. So he's learning to use a, a framing square. Now a framing square it looks like it looks like the letter L actually, doesn't it? But in fact, it's much more complex than that. Uh, framing squares have measurements and calculations built into them. So when he's laying out the rafters for an octagonal building, so to speak, he knows you know, what angles to make each of those pieces. And this isn't just something that anyone can do uh, off the top of your head. You think, oh, well, sure, you can just you know, draw on a piece of paper and you get it and just slap it up there. But that's not really how it works. All these pieces have to be joined and fitted together very carefully in order to work. So how would he have um, known, to, uh, would he have had schooling before this? If he was a slave, they typically weren't schooled. How would he have known the math to do that? Well, he's working under, under David Watson. And David Watson t really takes him under his wing, kind of as, as an apprentice, so to speak. And uh, in uh, European trades and in the very early colonial American trades, having an apprenticeship was, at that time, uh, <coughs> the way to learn a craft, whether you were a carpenter, a furniture maker, a shoemaker, a brick layer, a mason, uh, you would have been usually at a very young age, seven years old, even as young as that, uh, sent to go work with a master at a particular trade, and you would 
you live there and work under this person, usually until about the age of 21. And at the age of 21, you would have obtained and hopefully earned what are called your journeyman papers. And you would go out and journey to other shops where you would gain more experience in your, your said trade. Um, in this case, though, uh, you're absolutely right. How is John Hemmings learning this information? Well, he's, he's learning it by uh, working very closely with these groups of people who are already established in this trade in this shop. Uh, in this case, it's David Watson at first. And he's also working with uh, the other joiners who are at uh, the, the uh, joinery shop uh, at Mulberry Row. I'm guessing several of you probably already been to Mulberry Row at uh, Monticello. Uh, well, the remnant, rem remnants of the chimney are still there. Uh, but the joinery shop uh, was where most of the uh, joinery and the furnishings that were produced at Monticello and even for Poplar Forest were, were created. And that's where the training would have been done. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. uh, so he's working under David Watson for a few years. And then, uh, and then at age 22, um, uh, an Irish joiner, uh, named John, uh, James Dinsmore. Uh, he comes to work at Monticello for Thomas Jefferson. Now, James Dinsmore uh, is, uh, he's at, when Jefferson finds him, he's in Philadelphia. And Thomas Jefferson at that time is, uh, he's a very wealthy man. And you can tell by his, his estates that he only throws the best parties, drinks the finest wines, has the best furniture, uh, and that's really how he thinks of himself, as having these really great things. And you know, logically, he's not going to settle for some second-rate carpenter. So he goes out and he finds James Dinsmore, who has a reputation uh, as being a fantastic um, uh, joiner. And so uh, the, the deal is made. Mr. Dinsmore comes down uh, to Monticello and begins work there. Uh, working on the interior woodwork uh, of the building to further get it to where uh, Thomas Jefferson, you know, his, his dreams are, are headed towards this, this great um, Palladian influence building. Uh, and um, so John Hemmings uh, is sent at Thomas Jefferson's personal request to go work for, for Dinsmore. And this is really where the, I think the shift happens, where John Hemmings goes from being uh, a very good uh, carpenter, able to do things in wood, to really becoming uh, uh, a, a master in his own right uh, at this trade. And he's already got kind of what we call a knack for it by this time anyway. So in 17, uh, 98, he goes to work for, for Dinsmore and he learned under this master. And in 1799, about a year later, uh, Dinsmore and Hemmings together, they uh, build from, from scratch and, and install this 10 foot wide by over 2 foot high elliptical archway in the book room at Monticello. Uh, for those of you who have, who have been to Monticello, you might recognize this particular architectural piece. Um, I think they pointed out in just about every tour. Um, but it, in, in case you're not, it's, uh, uh, it's this uh, fantastic arch that spans, as I said, 10 feet, uh, that separates these, these two rooms, the, the book room from his, uh, from his bedroom. And, um, and, they, and two men, they put it together, this Dinsmore and Hemmings, they put it together in 12 days, 12 days. Now, that's, that's difficult enough for two masters to put it together. I mean, that's difficult enough, I think, even by today's standards, do you do work that quickly? And we're, they're doing this all with hand tools, all with hand tools. Um, but I think it really speaks to Hemings' abilities, uh, even being a, an enslaved man. Here's a person who, who's not in charge of his own destiny at all. But he is uh, still somewhere inside of him. It's either some kind of a, a passion or just some calling that allows him to be so good at this craft that he uh, 
can work side by side with this master craftsman from Philadelphia who was born a free man in another country um, and uh, went through his apprenticeship and journeyman and becoming a master. And here's this, here's this enslaved man who can keep up. I, I just think that's incredible, don't you? I really yes. do. Um, so in joinery, again, we, we have this kind of advancement, not only in, in this thinking about what kind of work it is, uh, but also in the tools that are being used. So now we're starting to use saws that have, for example, you saw the saw that I pulled out with those great big teeth. And, and here's a saw that a joiner might use. This has much, much smaller teeth for making a much more refined cut. This is the kind of cut that you might actually look at and see in, in the joints of the, the moldings and the trim. Uh, for example, here when you look around the house. And when you are looking around the house here at Poplar Forest, keep in mind that the interior woodwork that you see, the, the, the architraves, the moldings around the doors, um, and the, the chair rails, uh, the, the baseboards, these moldings are all made here by a small team of restoration craftsmen like myself, all by hand, completely by hand, without electric tools. Um, all, these, all these profiles you see here are all run with, with molding planes like these throughout the entire house. So you look around and you look, think about all the linear feet here. All this is done by hand, just like it was 200 and so on years ago. And so these are the tools that John Hemmings is, is learning to use, and he's gaining mastery in. And this continues to put him above the rest, above the other carpenters and craftsmen um, because he just has, uh, he's, he's got this knack for it. And he's working under one of the, what must be one of the best uh, joiners in this part of the country at that time. All right, so up to this point, we've talked about kind of the, uh, the buildup of John's uh, abilities as a carpenter, and then finally as, as a joiner. And you're all thinking, when is this guy going to talk about the furniture that we're all going to talk about? Okay, well, um, I have to <coughs> tell you all a, a little bit of a, of a caveat, if you will, um, to my presentation. Um, in this presentation, um, uh, I, have, I have learned that the furniture here at Monticello is currently uh, a renewed interest in the study of the, the furniture of Monticello, the furniture of Poplar Forest, and where they originate from. Uh, and a lot of what has been published is being reviewed. And now with things like the internet and this wonderful network of, of researchers and scientists and specialists, uh, uh, they are, uh, they're now able to say, well, you know, this piece of furniture, let's look at this again and let's see if we can really further narrow down where it's coming from, who made it, uh, did it really come from the joinery shop at Mulberry Row, or did it come from some other shop down the road? Did it come from, come from Williamsburg? And so uh, because of this, uh, they're kind of starting from scratch. They're going backwards a little bit, and they're reinvestigating each piece, and they're saying, uh, well, as we, as we look at each piece and we can decide uh, definitively whether or not it is uh, from the joinery, will say yes it is or or no it isn't. So when I talk about furniture in this next segment of this presentation, um, I'm going to talk about furniture that right now we are pretty fairly confident is from the Monticello joinery. Uh, it used to be that there were dozens of pieces that were attributed to the joinery and, uh, and as it is right now there are a handful that have been uh, recategorized as being definitively from the joinery. So just, just keep that in mind as I continue with this presentation. I have a question. Um, okay, so saying furniture from the join uh, to, uh, Monticello joinery. So do they have a patent or something? So what if they make a piece of furniture and somebody like it and copy it and then make it in their shop? So is there a conflict? I mean, or do, do they sue or uh, do they have sell the rights? I don't know. Do they, um, how do they? How do they do it nowadays? Uh, 
I think if I understand your, your question right, if, if they made something at the Mulberry Road joinery um, back when Hemmings was there and Dinsmore was there, uh, and they made a piece of furniture, how did they protect the design? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that there was really very much of that um, uh, protection of the design. I, I think it was quite common for uh, a cabinet maker in Williamsburg to like the design from a cabinet maker uh, in Richmond and and uh, and make uh, essentially a copy of it or or the closest thing they could approximate to it. Uh, I don't think that there was uh, uh, very much in terms of being able to protect the design. Um, now, on the other hand. Uh, I think a lot of what was being made in the Monticello joinery when it comes to furniture um, up to about the year 1806, uh, a lot of that furniture was really utilitarian in nature. So we're talking about uh, bookshelves and uh, what they called file presses, which is what we would call a, um, like a filing cabinet today. Um, and I think those are pretty much generic designs. I mean, if you were one filing cabinet from another filing cabinet, uh, uh, but I don't think that there was really much um, I don't know, intellectual protection uh, in those days. Does that answer your question? Yeah. There's very limited amount of that today. Yeah, exactly. Right. If you like a green, green piece of furniture or... You can it all. Right, of course. Uh, so, uh, it, mostly just styles. And most of the furniture uh, in those days, even out of uh, very well-known cabinet shops, was never labeled or signed. Uh, so most, even in those days, the cabinet maker who made the piece would, would make it for the client, collect their money, and move on to the next project, and wouldn't even sign their name to the back of it. So, and that, so maybe that idea, too, is very different than today. Yeah, so is that, in, not, not to get too far off, um, if you want to talk about this, then does that, um, say the master may not have actually made the piece, but it's not actually attributed to him? That's the case. Sure. Made it. Absolutely. And that and that happens today too, right? Yeah. You're, you work for a company and you put yeah. together programming and well, the company, the, the boss takes the, <laughs> the credit, right? Yeah. And and certainly that would happen. Sure. Well, that if I can make the um, uh, the historian, you, you want to go backwards and figure out if this piece of furniture is actually attributed to Monticello. It's made it very hard because yeah. if everybody's copy it, it could be like you said, money is sort of made it and that's an excellent point and you're absolutely right uh, you can imagine even today if someone to go into any of our homes uh, 200 years from now and try and say oh well this this furniture belonged to to you 200 years ago and it was in your house from this year to this year how in the world did anyone really know that I mean, it takes an awful lot of uh, uh, investigative research and an awful lot of luck really to be able to identify those kinds of things. So how do you know where the pieces came from that you've identified as being at Monticello? A lot of that comes from what's called uh, provenance. Uh, and provenance is basically a, a chain of documentary evidence uh, that, that kind of follows along with a particular piece of furniture. And this goes for all kinds of ob historical objects, but since we're talking about furniture. Um, so let's say that there's, um, uh, I don't know, addressing a, a chair or something, okay? And it's, uh, uh, and it belongs to Thomas Jefferson, and then it gets passed down to, to his daughter, and then her daughter, and then, and then a son, and then through the generations. If there's written documentation of this particular piece of furniture traveling along through time with this person, and, there, and all that information is consistently kept with the furniture, there's enough uh, descriptors that talk about a furniture, piece of furniture in a unique way, um, to kind of match things up. That's one of the ways that, that furniture is able to have a provenance. Make sense? Yes. Right. Also, I would think that a master carpenter would tend to slightly overmake something. And what I mean by that is, you know, they uh, would make it so it would hold up to, to everything. And if somebody's going to knock it off, if they're going to try to make it a little simpler, a little easier. And you could, might could see the hallmark of the master carpenter, say, dovetail instead of box joints. Uh, that the master carpenter would do the dovetails because they hold together better. And then the knockoff would be the box joints. You say, okay, well, the master carpenter did that one, and that was probably a knockoff. Yeah. Certainly, certainly possibilities. Uh, I think in line with that, something that would be more common would just be just the, the really minute details of something. A, a master carpenter throughout his 
uh, body of work would say, oh, well, he spaces his joints this way, or this is a particular theme that follows through all his pieces. And, uh, and, it's, and you see in this piece, even though it's, it's similar, it lacks that. So that might be a red flag, certainly, for two yeah. Um So uh, I'm going to, if you don't mind me, kind of get back a little bit to talking about the furniture at the, at the joinery versus uh, <coughs> what we consider as cabinet shop furniture. Uh, I'm not sure how we're doing on the time here, uh, but um, I think we're doing okay. You're at the top of the hour. Oh, perfect. That's great. Um, right on schedule then. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the joinery made furniture um, up until about 1806 is all being made really with uh, utilitarian uh, purposes in mind. So they're, they're boxes for transporting things, they're um, boxes for books, they're uh, 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 filing presses uh, uh, for keeping his his letters together. And of course, Thomas Jefferson uh, wrote thousands and thousands of letters throughout his life and kept his correspondence. Uh, so he would have had many, many of, of, of those kinds of things. Um, in fact, if you look behind you, uh, this bookshelf against the wall uh, is a reproduction of uh, one of the uh, book boxes that sets that Jefferson has made to transport books. Uh, from one place to another. And uh, uh, maybe after the talk, if you get a chance to look at it a little closer, you'll see that it's actually several boxes that are just stacked together. And, um, and all the boxes are well made. They're made. You'll see that they're made with dovetail joints um, and uh, made with really thick, heavy wood. Well, they were made so that they could all be taken apart, one from the next, have a board nailed across, the, stuffed with books, have a board nailed across the top, and then shipped by wagon to another place. Uh, so it was furniture like that. I mean, it looks nice. I mean, most of us wouldn't mind having something like that in, in our homes. Um, but it's it's not it's not the French furniture, not this King Louis XVI furniture that he was having shipped in great quantities uh, from Paris. It wasn't the uh, uh, beautiful colonial American furniture that he had collected before his time uh, in France uh, from wonderful cabinet makers uh, around the colonies, such as Williamsburg, Philadelphia, and New York. Um, so this, this was much simpler furniture. It was nice, certainly. And, and there were certainly pieces that were made of exotic woods, like mahogany. Mahogany is not an American wood. Uh, mahogany in those, in those days was called San Domingo de ma mahogany. So uh, places like Haiti was where that uh, particular species of wood would be from. Um, so they certainly looked nice, but they, they lacked the kind of uh, elegance and decoration that um, you might find in some of the pieces when you go to uh, Monticello, for example, the much finer pieces. Um, and kind of to help illustrate, here are a couple of pieces. I can pass them around, actually, um, if you promise to be nice to me. Um, so here's a, here's a drawer. This is actually a, a, a drawer that I made from, from my own shop. Um, and this is just a, a drawer for, for tools from one of my, my tool cabinets. Uh, this is all uh, hand, handmade, uh, hand plain, hand cut uh, dovetails and everything. But it's a utilitarian drawer. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's relatively thick. The dovetails are, are, are quite wide, um, quite crude in the back even, you might say. Uh, the bottom is, is nailed on to a, to a rabbit or a groove in the side, um, just for simplicity's sake. Um, and uh, just kind of get this thing in so I can get my tools organized so I can get to work on the other stuff that really matters. Uh, so this is, uh, this is what I would consider a, a good representation of what we might expect from, from utilitarian work that you might find coming from a joiner shop. Are you welcome to pass that around? And how do they slide? Uh, this, this slides uh, yeah, into a, basically a, a square hole between two sides, sides. and on uh, on and on a um, on two rails. Okay, uh, that's my question. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, if you were to compare that with with this, now this one I'm a little nervous about because actually this is actually a I'm a under a, a, a threat of, of life of messing this one up. This is uh, this actually is a drawer from a, a tea table I made for my wife, who happens to be here today. Um, <laughs> and so I, if, I, if I mess this up, she, uh, uh, well, I, I might not be able to give the presentation this afternoon. Um, but this is uh, something that you might expect from a higher-end cabinet shop, uh, where they're using 
Uh, they're using inlays. They're using veneers. Um, they're using exotic woods uh, in a decorative uh, way. Um, the, the dovetails are a little more refined in the front and the back. Uh, the details are a little different. The, the sides of the drawer are, are a little bit narrower material. Um, a little more care has been put into the, into the bottom and the alignment of the grain. Uh, the bottom here is actually cut away so that it fits into grooves cut into the sides so that no matter how much, if you put weight on the, uh, on the bottom, it's not going to loosen it and, and come away. Uh, so the elements here are, are much more refined and they take a lot more time and care and thought uh, and, and dedication. Um, and not to say that the joiners at Monticello aren't dedicated, but they're dedicated to joinery. They're dedicated to these immense projects. Monticello, doing the refurbishing of Monticello. They're dedicated to Poplar Forest uh, in 1806 when construction begins here. Uh, so they're not really doing this kind of work. And uh, I guess I'll start with you pass that around. Hey, pass it around. It's got to be promised to be careful. With Do you also use glues? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, in, in terms of glues, uh, in those days, uh, hide glue was, uh, was the adhesive uh, available. Uh, there were several kinds of high glues. These are glues that are made from uh, uh, the rendered uh, other parts of, of animals during the uh, hide making process. The making tan the tanneries would also make glue, um, and there was also fish glue as well. They didn't get fish, but uh, most of the glues in those days was uh, as a, a side part of the tanning business. Yes, so they were animal glues. So while those are, are going uh, around, um, we'll continue here talking about the, uh, uh, the furniture. Um, and I'd like to draw your attention to, to the pieces I have here. Now I'm going to see, maybe I can move them around just a little bit uh, since we've got some people here. You're fine, maybe all right. Uh, Vince, if you don't mind. Let's go make this out a little bit. Uh, so as I said, uh, uh, prior to 1806, a lot of the furniture being made, uh, furniture being made at, at uh, Monticello, was utilitarian in nature. Now, this particular piece of furniture here um, is uh, attributed to James Dinsmore. Now, this piece here is not a reproduction. This piece here is, is an original uh, that is attributed to the Irish master joiner, James Dinsmore. And, uh, and he is making this, and this is one of a set of four. Only two are known to exist still. Um, if you know what the other two are, talk to me after. <laughs> but um, but these, uh, this Pembroke table uh, was actually made to be a, a part of this set of four that would be able to fit together they would fit together um, to create uh, either a large table, um, a large square table, a long table. Thomas Jefferson was very interested in furniture that could be put to different uses, could have different kinds of, 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 of shapes, uh, fit different you know, uh, kinds of circumstances, whatever he was looking for. And so this particular kind of a table uh, was made with that in mind. Now, uh, uh, someone was asking about the uh, the provenance. How do we know that these pieces are are from the Monticello joinery and not from Williamsburg or somewhere else? Well, uh, one of our uh, uh, colleagues up at Monticello, his name's Bob Self. Um, uh, he's retired now, but uh, he is a, a furniture conservator uh, and furniture expert, and he found uh, at least one of these tables, I believe, and. Uh, and he was able to look at the joinery of, of this particular table and the size of it, the dimensions of it, and say, you know, this is, is very similar to, to other work that was put out of the joinery and also to letters that we have talking about a particular style of table. Uh, particularly regarding the size of, of the tops, uh, there's a, a letter between um, uh, between Dinsmore and, and Jefferson where Jefferson is saying, uh, 
I need you to get a hold of this, this size mahogany to make these tables. And uh, Dinsmore says, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Jefferson, I can't get you this, this size wood. And Jefferson comes back and says, no, no, you have to get this size wood because it has to fit with these other tables that, are, that you're going to build uh, because they have to fit just right. So there's a lot of back and forth about getting these details just right. And it's because of this kind of written evidence and corresponding measurements uh, against existing pieces where we can say, no, we're pretty sure that this is what we got here. And so that's, that's one of the main importances of this piece of furniture. Now there was another question about, well, you know, if uh, you know, the master might take credit for a piece of work, uh, but it's very common for the, the apprentices or the journeymen to also have a, a hand in really doing the work work. And that also might be true, and it's, and it's probable, it's probable even in modern shops to have numerous hands working on a single piece just for expediency's sake, right? So, uh, so even though this particular piece is attributed to Dinsmore, it's likely uh, and very possible that there were other carpenters in the shop at Mulberry Row, including perhaps John Hemmings, working on, uh, if not this table, maybe one of uh, its other mating uh, matches. So uh, that's uh, one of the interesting and exciting parts about this particular example that I have here for you today. Um, along with uh, some of the other examples uh, we have uh, is, this is a reproduction of the revolving top table. Uh, there is a revolving top table at Monticello. If you've been there to their gallery, I think they've got it on display uh, now, as a matter of fact. Um, and as I mentioned, Jefferson was really enamored with things that, that moved and, and did things. Uh, and, uh, and he would design all kinds of contraptions uh, based on things he had seen, things he had imagined. And, and this was one of them. This was a, a, a table that um, he had either seen a design of or designed himself. And an avid reader and letter writer, you can imagine that he would be able to have his books and letters on this table and be able to work on any or all of them simultaneously. Um, certainly the man had more focus than I do. <laughs> but um, the reason I brought this out, and, and this is important, is because, uh, and this goes back to uh, the, uh, the written evidence that we have. Uh, there's a letter from Jefferson uh, uh, writing about uh, uh, have, have John Hemmings finish the frame for the revolving top table as soon as you can and have it sent to Poplar Forest. Now, we're quite certain that we know that the, at least the frame, you know, as I said, there's an original uh, at Monticello, and we're quite certain that the frame at least is has been built by John Hemmings. But right now, the revolving top, we're not quite sure about because it's not concrete written evidence that says, yes, uh, John Hemmings made the circular top. Uh, but uh, in the event that he, he did make the, the frame, he certainly had more than enough ability and skill to make a circular top. After all, he had gotten his foot feet wet, so to speak, in carpentry by working for uh, a wheelmaker. I've never seen a wheel anything but round. So <laughs> circular work is something that he certainly had, had under his belt. Well, how does it put together so that it turns? Uh, well, let's see. I might be able to demonstrate this without making it all fall apart. Okay. <laughs> so I believe, I may not be able to show you. Um, does, it, does it look right? Yeah. 
was Patsy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Oh. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So there is a little washer right there that it rides on. Oh, okay. You know, just to give it some space. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Cool. And sometimes in the summer when it gets too bad, it does fit nice. Like, yeah. yeah. like, yeah. like, yeah. like a friction fit drawer, right? <laughs> <laughs> Now, would have those pieces been made of wood, or would they have been made of metal? They would have because been. You, you have the hinges that are metal. So. Th th it would have been made out of metal. I think the wood would have worn too quickly with too. the friction. So is there like maintenance? Uh, do you need to oil the join, or does it keep rotating forever? Well, I'm, I'm sure like lots of things uh, that have enough deferred maintenance, uh, they, uh, they eventually get maintained whether it's scheduled or not. <laughs> Someone mentioned uh, maintenance uh, on, on parts, and, and that's actually a uh, fits well with this next segment. Um, you'll notice that uh, in terms of the shop made furniture, there really aren't a lot of examples of it. And there's a really great reason for that. Um, most of the work being done uh, at Monticello uh, and here at Poplar Forest um, was maintenance, um, was ongoing maintenance ongoing construction. Um, you can imagine for uh, those of us who, who own homes, uh, it's one house project after another. Uh, as much as we'd love to sit back on Saturday and do something on our own time, well, we've got to fix the gutter, we've got to fix the loose floorboard, the squeaky stair, whatever it might be. Well, if this was going on, ha imagine having essentially uh, two mansions that have to, to take care of. And so this kind of work is going on all the time, not to mention constant restorations. Uh, Jefferson was famous for uh, tearing things down and building back up. Um, uh, he was uh, kind of a nightmare uh, interior decorator <laughs> that way. Um, but um, uh, so maintenance and upkeep was, was a huge responsibility for the joiners in the shop. And uh, yes, there were, there were several carpenters and joiners that were working under Thomas Jefferson, but you know, they weren't all of that job description. And so they, they had to be out doing, um, uh, doing these things to the house and didn't really have the kind of time uh, to be a, a, in a furniture making industry there. They kind of had to make it as they could and in a way that was efficient for them. Grab my paper brain here. <coughs> so, uh, so along with the, the revolving top table, um, there are really only a couple of other pieces of furniture through, uh, through written documentation that we understand that, that Hemings had, had made. Um, some of them we have examples of, uh, some of them we, we don't. Uh, but we have examples that are, are pretty near to what they would be like. Um, hey Vince, would you mind helping me move this out of the way? <coughs> So, this chair, that I don't, uh, you're welcome to, to come sit in after the presentation, um, is a, another reproduction of what's called a Campeche chair, or a siesta chair. Now, the particular does, design of this chair comes from, from Latin America, uh, as I understand it, and Jefferson first heard about this design uh, in Louisiana. And, uh, of course, 
uh, who was in Louisiana, but the French was in Louisiana for quite some time. Um, and so it's really no surprise that uh, his, it, it fell under his interest. Um, but this, uh, this particular uh, Campeche chair is based off of one that was owned by Mrs. Trist, who was a friend of his. Uh, but in letters uh, from Jefferson, we know that John Hemings had made uh, a siesta chair like this one. Um, or if not just one, he may have made a few. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know if there are any of them still in existence. But there's a few remarkable uh, notes about the manufacture of this kind of a chair. Now, uh, certainly you've got the shaped arm, which is, which is nice, but not really terribly complicated. Um, the, uh, this floor, maybe some of you can see up here in the front. Um, the way that these, uh, these arm supports are, are fastened into the, the arms here, is what we call a mortise and tenon joint. This is a through tenon that goes all the way through to the top. And basically, that's a, a square peg in a square hole uh, that holds these, these together. Again, not particularly uh, in, incredible or noteworthy, except that this is a very familiar joint. Um, many joints in the structure of this very house are put together in this way. Um, so certainly a joint you would have been familiar with. Uh, we have here, this is a kind of a a lap joint uh, where this, these X-shaped stretchers meet one another. Uh, two, two halves of the adjoining pieces are cut away, and they fit into each other and create one thickness. Again, not particularly noteworthy, except that the way this chair is held together, the originals, um, this leather upholstery makes up the chair, reaches around the arms and is nailed in and tacked over on the outside of the chair. When the chair is constructed and put together, um, you see that it's not held by nails or anything, and, and even high glue at the time, the chair's taken an enormous amount of abuse. Um, so uh, after a time, uh, if this leather was just laid on this chair and tacked in place, it would come loose after uh, probably not, not too very long. But the interesting thing about this chair is that the upholstery is is put on wet. They take the leather, they put it on wet, and they wrap it around, and it's nailed and intact in place. And then as it dries, it shrinks and it locks all the joints together. And that is a, a pretty ingenuitive way to use materials, I think. Um, and certainly something that uh, you would have to really understand furniture to understand how, that, how you, to make that happen. Um, so that's one of the reasons I think the, the Campeche chair and the siesta chair is a very interesting piece of furniture. Now, there are a couple other pieces that I wish, I wish, I wish I could show you, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to help hopefully draw you a mental picture of what they are. Um, so towards, uh, uh, towards the end of <coughs> Jefferson's life, um, uh, Jefferson uh, grants Hemings his freedom. Uh, in, uh, in 1826, uh, just a few months uh, before Jefferson passes on July 4th, um, he, grants, uh, he grants Hemings his, his freedom. Uh, and, uh, and before this, uh, Hemings knows that his, his old master is, uh, is getting old and uh, a bit infirm, and so he has it in his mind to make the coffin that Thomas Jefferson will uh, be laid to rest in. And so with this in mind, uh, Hemming sets aside uh, a piece of wood that, uh, that he knows this is what it's for. And, and any of you who've worked in any kind of art before or, or with wood or sculpture, sometimes you, you can look at a material and say, you know what, I know what that is. I don't, it's not for what I'm working on now. I'm going to save this for that perfect, that perfect thing it's going to be. And, and that's what Henning saw when he looked at this particular piece of wood. And uh, when his old master dies on July 4th, 1826, uh, Hemings takes that piece of wood and he builds Thomas Jefferson's coffin. And um, of course, you don't have any, any images of that. Um, and, uh, and that's really something. For, for a formerly enslaved man, uh, 
to, you would think that there'd, be, there'd always be this kind of, an, uh, uh, even in the back of his mind, maybe an, an enemy relationship with this man who owns him, who owned him his entire life. Not only owned him, but owned all the members of his family. Um, here he has this uh, very uh, emotional connection to him to say, I'm going to build this coffin uh, out of this wonderful piece of wood for this man who, for whatever reason, I, he holds so much respect and admiration for um, to build his coffin, um, and, uh, uh, and and me personally as a as a craftsman and a historian, I'm very interested in, in that relationship and, and and how that would how that would how would work out. I just think that's very fascinating. Um, and uh, one other piece, uh, I'm going to kind of go back in time a little bit here. Uh, uh, as I mentioned. Hemings is really a, a master joiner. Um, in 1809, uh, James Dinsmore, uh, he leaves uh, work for, uh, from Thomas Jefferson, and he goes to uh, work for Madison, James Madison, at his uh, Montpelier home, and he goes to work there. And John Hemings is now the master of the joinery shop at Mulberry Row. And all the responsibilities of all the woodwork for uh, for Monticello and, and here at Poplar Forest fall under under John Hemings. Uh, and it's, uh, it's during this time that John Hemings builds what he considers his masterpiece. And he builds this piece for uh, Ellen Randolph of uh, Coolidge, who's um, one of the granddaughters of Thomas Jefferson, uh, who uh, they, they all lovingly called, uh, called Hemings. They call him Daddy. That's pretty surprising too, I think. Um, and he builds this, this desk for, uh, for Alan, and he ships it out. He considers it his masterpiece. You can imagine he's put his heart and soul into it. Everything that he's learned in the lifetime of carpentry and joinery that he's, he's been a part of, he puts into this piece, and he sends it by ship to her, and the ship sinks, and his piece is lost. And uh, frantically, Jefferson writes to, to Hemings and he says, Johnny, can you, can you make this piece again uh, for Ellen? And by this time, Hemings is just, he's, he's too old. He's, he's already given everything he can. And he says, I'm, I'm sorry, I, uh, I don't have the eyesight anymore. And, and besides that, I can't remember all the details. And so unfortunately, that, that piece is lost. Uh, but it was, it was his masterpiece. And, uh, uh, and there's really no doubt that John Hemings was a master in his craft. An enslaved man who had no mastery over his own destiny, no choice in the skills that he learned in life, um, and uh, no, no ability to object to the, to the speed or the pressures of that life that he, was li he lived. Uh, he managed to become uh, such a highly respected and uh, highly adept craftsman. Um, and, uh, and it's just, uh, I think, a wonderful thing that his work continues to live on uh, at, at Monticello, and particularly here at, at Poplar Forest, uh, where he spent most of his time uh, being the head of the, uh, the woodworking, uh, all the woodwork that you see here. So really something to think about. Yes, ma'am. What's the difference between a master carpenter and a master joiner? Well, that's a good question. Thank you. You can be a master carpenter. You can be a master joiner. You can be a master cabinet maker. Um, and uh, there are several different kinds of of woodworking. And and there's and carpentry as a whole is a kind of woodworking. Um, there's house carpentry, which is erecting the bones of of a building. So the timber framing, the uh, putting down the uh, the joists for the floors and uh, the beams and the um, uh, the framework for the roof. That's all work that's done by the carpenters, the house carpenters. So when you go into this room here after the after the talk, take a look around, and that's the work that the house carpenters would have done. They would have uh, taken these these uh, these square beams, rough beams, and put them into place that would make up walls and uh, uh, and and doorways uh, to build the bones of the structure and. And there would be a master who would, that would be his, his living and his training, and, and he would be at a, uh, at a level of, of understanding 
uh, that would put him higher than the people who were working under him. Uh, then you have a, a joiner, and joiners 